Welcome to Europe PCR 2019. With me, my two colleagues. Let me first of all introduce myself. I am Dr. Ashwin Mehta, cardiologist at Jaslok Hospital, Mumbai, India. With me is Dr. Upendra Kaul, who is the international cardiologist at Batra Hospital, Delhi. And we also we have with us Dr. Nirvan Chaudhary, who is from University of Wales, Cardiff. And we'll have a discussion amongst three of us. And you know, all these days we were concentrating on the drug polymer, but now I think we should also think about the platform and the importance of platform. And I think starting with Katsatri, who said that the, the, the strut thickness is important and thicker the stand, strut more is the restenosis and also associated with these other side effects. Upendra, you tell me, what is the rationale for using a thin strut stents? As you rightly said, the concept started way back in 2003 when Dr. Kastrati with his workers showed that the strut thickness of 50 versus 130, restenosis was lower and TLRs were lower. After that came the drug eluting stents and this uh, concept got sort of uh, mixed up and uh, all the energy and concentration was spent on the polymer and the drug. Having leveled that, how to improve the performance of the stents, now we have come to the stage that the platform matters and thinner the strut, better it is. And in a recent meta-analysis has been seen that strut, stra uh, strut thickness of 70, which is called the ultra thin, mm -hmm. is clearly superior than thicker stents. Uh, they have lower target lesion, target uh, vessel failure, mainly driven by reduction in myocardial infarction and reduction in strength thrombosis. I think, uh, Dr. Chaudhary, I, what do you think? I think there is another issue, and that's a technical issue, the deliverability. Yes. Do you have any thoughts about the deliverability? Like, would they conceptually help to deliver them at the target site easily? Yeah, I mean, you would expect so because the thicker the struts, bigger the crossing profile. Mm. So as you come down on the strut thickness from 140, as Dr. Cole was saying, to now 60, 65, your, your crossing profile is substantially reduced. So and that has made life much easier for me as one of the younger guys. And so I, have, so I de de definitely agree that it is, it is the way forward with deliverability makes the procedure easier. And obviously, there are real-life outcome advantages, as, as we have already mentioned. But I, except that one thing that I would anticipate, the two downsides. One is that, would it make any difference in the radial strength? And the second is the visibility. You know, especially when you are dealing with the osteal sites, I think the visibility becomes very, very crucial. And I wonder, and I, I'm sort of in my own fantasy, in my imagination, uh, whether uh, with the reduction of stent, start thickness, would we be compromising the radial strength or a visibility? Upendra, I mean, uh, what are your thoughts about this aspect? Well, with the chromium cobalt, because all the ultra thin stents are chromium cobalt, mm -hmm. where the visibility is not a very big issue, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, all the data which we are talking about in the meta-analysis by Sripal Bangalore, which came last year, mm -hmm. it is basically not on osteal sites, not on very calcified vessels, and not in CTOs. So you, you would not uh, no, no. be... We don't have the data for oh, that. You don't we, have the data We need yeah. data for oh, that. I got it. But got in it. the common garden lesions, which we day-to-day -day do, lower strut thickness, and now we have come up to 60 also, leads to less trauma, leads to better laminar flow. Sure, inflammation also. Inflammation goes down. Yeah. And that leads to lower myocardial infarctions because the branches, side branches, the overlap of the branches by the stent strut is less. So you have less enzyme leaks and most of the myocardial infarction reduction is because of lower enzyme leaks and also that leads to lower stent thrombosis. There is no difference in mortality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then in that case, it leads to another question. I think Dr. Chaudhary, you could say that when we, um, is there been a robust study or a data? I think concept is comparatively new. Yeah. And, um, like that, can we go to 50, 40, 30, 20? There should be some kind of a limit. You can't keep on going in, because there must be some uh, downside and it should, it should be uh, therefore necessary that at some point 
we st stabilize. And, and my point is that for, is there a data like, a, a, of late, I think uh, recently we have a talent study which was published in Lancet. Yes, yes. Can you throw some light on that study? The talent study was um, an RCT, which was in fact probably the first all comers true in the ultra thin strut population. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. ones before that uh, were more medium risk patients. So mm -hmm. this was the first proper all comers which compared ultra thin strut supraflex strength with uh, Zines, which is a thin strut and, and the market leader. Uh, one to one design, 1450 odd patients. Uh, and what it showed is uh, it was designed as a non-inferiority, so it met its non-inferiority margins. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you then look into the absolute numbers, then the ultra-thin strut stent, as has been the suggestion from previous medium-risk population, are all in the, in the favor of the ultra-thin strut. And, and especially uh, what was of note is the ischemia-driven target lesion revascularization, TLR, uh, was a substantial reduction in the per protocol analysis of nearly 60%. Uh, right. and, and so that has been uh, very welcoming from the interventional community and, and even increases the data that we already have with regards to evidence emerging in favor of it. But, but you didn't answer to my two concerns, the radial strength yes. as well as the visibility. Are so, they compromised to any extent? Well, I mean, the reason we went from stainless steel to cobalt chromium were those two factors. So cobalt chromium are more visible than stainless steel. Uh, and number two, radial strength, obviously there is a recommendation that it needs to be twice the level of the highest possible blood pressures of six, 600 millimeters of mercury. That's the minimum you require for, uh, for any stent. And all these stents, ultra thin struts, most of their radial strengths is around 800. And if you compare that with stents like Zions or Promus, they're not too different. So it's, it's just beyond that the technology, fortunately from the engineering side, is, is very robust. I agree with you. I think that we have a radial strength more than what we need, yes, much yes. more than what we need. And then it comes to me that now, at the, with the drug-eluting stent with any platform, we had reached the uh, restenosis rate across the board with all kinds of cases taken into a consideration to approximately in a single digit, like six to eight yeah. percent. And yes. in fact, uh, in a large size vessel, it came down to almost two percent. And then now with this new platform and a new concept, uh, do you think both safety and efficacy will be still uh, better than the, what we have been currently using or currently in practice? So, in other words, what I'm asking is, what do you think is the future of the metallic stand with the concept of reducing strut thickness? Uh, I think in the smaller vessels, there still is scope. Yes. Uh, only yesterday there was a study from the other loose <clears throat> ultra thin strength or zero, where it showed that the long-term results were much better, lower restenosis in vessels less than 2.5. Usually, you know, most studies had taken 2.75 as this thing. So in smaller vessels, I think it, uh, you know, it's very logical that if the amount of metal and the mm -hmm. thickness is lower, yeah. the restenosis will be lower. That, that makes and a point. That's yes. very important. But in fact, I can raise another issue. And that is, I think, the one clinical situation where I think there is an instant stenosis and we are going to put another stent, uh, another drug eluting stent, just in case. Then I think uh, if, if something which is uh, thinner, then it is uh, less, uh, less uh, space occupying and therefore that's a, a distinct advantage. And one so, more advantage is that the OCT studies have shown very early healing. Within 30 days, more than 90% of the struts, uh, struts have already, you know, been covered. Neo intima has already formed. So there is a case with these stents that we can reduce the duration of the depth. I think one month may be enough. This will be very useful. This will be very useful for yeah. patients yeah. who have a high mm -hmm. bleeding risk yeah. or anybody who has to undergo an emergency procedure or surgery where you need to uh, you made reduce it. Absolutely, you made a very, very important point because the population which we are dealing with uh, for uh, occlusive coronary disease, the age group and uh, yeah. the, they, their breeding tendency, almost 20% of them yeah. could be considered in the high risk uh, situation, high risk uh, uh, cases. Yeah. So therefore, um, uh, this is important that anything that can help to reduce the DAPT duration is always welcome. And I and think some of this is across the platform, as, as you've yeah. been mentioning. Uh, 
and I guess these are all hypotheses generating, and we will have to slightly wait to make sure More that the, the, these can be translated into real life practice. But you know, times are exciting, and and, and uh, you know, the scope for using these these technologies is. Is going to we have more and more evidence in the next few years. Yes, I think it's very true that I think all this time we were concentrating on the drug and the polymer. And we never gave enough attention to the platform. And now that uh, the design, the start thickness, keeping in mind deliverability, keeping in mind inflammatory response, keeping in mind uh, uh, also the, the restenosis attached, I think they, the, all these factors are very important and it, that will improve the both safety and efficacy, which we always desire and strive for better. And now that we, our population, the cases that we are doing, since the simple cases with the, uh, a very small amount of myocardium at risk are being managed very effectively medically. Yes. So we are entrusted with the responsibility for more complex situations, more complex cases, and therefore, these factors that we just discussed are going to be of uh, very vital importance. Uh, what do you say, uh, Upendra? Yeah, I fully agree with you because uh, we're seeing more and more complex cases. We're seeing more and more, you know, high bleeding risk cases, elderly population, and we need a product which is very safe, equally efficacious, so that uh, you know, interventional cardiology coronary intervention go on increasing and uh, I think the time has come that we need to do a freedom study again with this new generation stints with For modern treatment patients? of diabetics okay, yeah, okay, fine. and then see uh, is uh, that old concept that multivessel disease and diabetes should go for surgery. I think we need to relook at that with this kind of stents. I think that's a good suggestion yes. and I think that the last question to both of you. Would it impact the pattern of your practice? Would you, would you straight away consider uh, that uh, utilization of uh, ultra-thin stents, ultra-thin start stents in your practice uh, liberally or uh, would you be choosy? How, how would you be uh, altering your pattern of practice? I think it makes sense to use as many, as much as possible ultra-thin uh, because it has been shown the market leader, the Everolimus diluting durable polymer stent, the new generation uh, ultra thin stents have shown to be equivalent and lower myocardial infarctions. And lower myocardial infarction is a very important thing. And a series of uh, studies from, you know, Orsiro have shown that. And that's basically because of the lower strut. Everything else remaining the same. Mm. But then, uh the recent study in, in Lancet, it was uh, compared with uh, science, and um, it was a non-inferiority trial, and then Supraflex, I think, and that uh, stent, uh, uh, how does it differ from um, R0? I think one thing is that, yeah. yeah. The difference is that uh, Supraflex or Supraflex screws, all the sizes, all the diameters are 60 micrograms. Wow. Whereas with the other stents, for three, up to three millimeters is 60, but it jumps to 80. At 80, it does not qualify to be defined in the As definition ultra of ultra thin. That, that, so that, that is think, the difference. Yeah. I think that, that, that yeah. I think not many people yeah. uh, know realize about it. it. Yeah. I think they don't realize and therefore um, this is important. Same is true for synergy. Mm. That also as the uh, diameter increases, the strut thickness increases. Mm. As, you know, as Professor Cole was saying, when you look at the metanalysis, you have signs it's just not uh, MIs, but also TLR, also stent thrombosis. Everything is mo moving towards being significantly better, if not better, statistically. Uh, and I guess the advantage will be even more in the more complex patients that you're referring to that yes. we get nowadays. So maybe the next study should be patients with more complex anatomy, so patients who have multivessel disease, uh, patients who have a greater proportion of diabetics, to see whether the difference of the ultra-thin stent struts compared to the conventional thin struts, where the difference is teased out even more because of the higher event rate in the control arm. So that would be interesting to see whether that comes out in the near future. I think we have planned a study, which uh, I'm sure will approach you also. It's an Indian study mm -hmm. comparing Supraflex with Zions in a diabetic patient population with multivessel disease. 
out of which three quarters will be triple vessel disease and one quarter double vessel disease, no single vessel disease. And diabetes treated as per the today's drugs, SGLT2, GLP1, and uh, liberal use of OCT, and also, you know, fractional flow reserve to have complete revascularization. Mm -hmm. And the secondary endpoint of this study is to compare our results with the case percentages of freedom. I, 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 th I appreciate, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good idea because, you know, India is the capital of diabetes and the diabetic problem is rampant and we have to deal with this problem day in and day out. So it is relevant to our country much more probably, more than it, whatever it is in Europe. And therefore I think that's a good thought. I think uh, we have been, uh, we should be doing a more justice to diabetic population. I think combination of diabetes and coronary disease sure. is rampant in our country. Well, it's increasing in the West as well, but as you're alluding, is when you do these studies, it's very important you do it in more in a syntax two fashion, which yes. is pressure wire guide, which is physiological, and then anatomical optimization with some sort of imaging, so that we can push the boundaries of you know, quality PCI uh, to say it is equivalent yeah. to surgical outcomes, especially in the higher, or That's at right. least the intermediate tertile of syntax score. So as long as it's done properly, I mean, this will be exciting times. So my friends, we conclude that the ultra-thin strut stent concept is here to stay and needs to be explored. And that the preliminary data shows that it has a great future. And uh, working on various kinds of substrates of patients uh, with uh, the, the various uh, combinations, per permutations of uh, clinical conditions uh, can result into an improvement in both safety and efficacy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you both. Thank you.